Mm. The age of cloud, we're back to needing to understand IPv4 and subnet masks and address allocation and a whole lot of dark magic that I was pleased to have escaped. <laughs> yeah. It all comes back to haunt you. Yeah, yeah, you're not kidding. Hello everyone, welcome to TechCraft, the show where we talk about tech while playing Minecraft potentially badly. Who knows? We'll see what's going to happen. Uh, we have an amazing guest today. Rick is the Chief Consulting Officer of Black Marble, a software company in the UK, and Microsoft MVP in Azure since 2014, and he's been a Microsoft Regional Director since 2020. So Rick, have you played Minecraft before? Do you know, I never have. So this is either going to be embarrassing or entertaining. It could go either way. <laughs> Let's hope that it is kind of both, but mainly entertaining, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. And we can now see that there we have Rick is here. I am going to show. There we go. We have you have a lovely purple pants and everything going on. We haven't created the avatars or selected our skin, so it's all randomly generated. So we're going to now start exploring the world. Any expectations, Rick, on what do you think we're going to find? Yeah, you know, I, I really don't. I mean, so my friends kids play minecraft but they tend to you know build these great things with redstone and god knows what i've never really played yeah. it never i've never really quite understood because there's there's like story mode isn't there and i always thought minecraft was this thing where you built things with blocks so the fact that you actually have to wander around with a person and start mining things and <laughs> I, I can't jump um exactly actually, it's a ah there we go where are you actually oh there you are <laughs> perfect so we are playing classic Minecraft, so it is very much a bare bones version. So we have very simple functionality. We can just jump around, we can do a bit of digging, but there's no monsters or baddies or something like that attacking us. So that is positive in my opinion. And do we want to actually head to high ground to see a bit more? Whether I can play Minecraft and talk at the same time. I think we kind of established that. That is no the question. <laughs> Yeah, and okay, so this is actually a bit trickier because we have a lot of mountainous landscape. So I'm going to give you a tip that I'm going to actually use myself as well. So I'm going to click fly on with Z and then I'm going to fly. I can see you there. There we go. So we can fly if the jumping gets too hard. But that, we can oh, also do the jump. Oh, yeah, that's convenient, isn't it? So while we fly around, oh, there's flowers. We can maybe go check the flowers. Why we are flying around, I spoke with you before and you talked about uh, crawling through the buildings, pulling network cables in your dark past. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what was the major learning from those times that you were doing that? I was, I was really lucky um, when I was younger that, um, oh, here we go, back in my day. So I, I started sort of working in tech while I was at university. Um, and I was fortunate that in those days, students were given the opportunity to get involved. You know, we, we could yeah. work with the guys in our university computing department. And they were really just installing PCs at the time in the university, which kind of ages me, right? And I was really fortunate that I could help out. So I, yeah, like, like I, I say occasionally, I was involved in everything from crawling around the building, putting cables in. How do I turn fly off? Ah, Z. Um, from putting cables in to then, you know, putting PCs in for people, putting servers in for people. And I think the one benefit it always gave me is I have this sort of broad understanding of how everything connects together. These days when, when I'm sort of hiring people from universities, they're, they're brilliant. They're really clever people, but they don't necessarily know what networking is or you know you don't build pcs like i used to do god here we go again i, I had to, to think about setting jumpers and making sure that the cards didn't clash on their their io ports or their irqs and, and these days you just sort of slot something in if there's even anything you need to slot in and i think somehow we've lost some of that fundamental understanding that that is really helpful when you're trying to solve problems and debug things i kind of have this <clears throat> 30 years of baggage that can actually be really useful and it's still really relevant i think even when you start talking about you know modern cloud computing and everything's hosted and all that kind of stuff yeah um 
just having that breadth of experience was the life in the old IT pro yet. <laughs> Exactly. I very much agree. Uh, it does bring a lot to the table and like getting your hands dirty in that way can benefit a lot as well. Yeah. Play with different stuff as well. I mean, I, I started with well, netware and I've done bits of Unix and I've done mm. Linux and, you know, Word was not the behemoth that it is today. I've got people in the organization using word star and word perfect and other things that have now gone the way of the dinosaurs right and yeah um you you sort of learn not to be afraid of computers it was all about sort of transferable skills so it wasn't so much which key, key do i press to do this but you know what are the things i need to look for in this new program to accomplish a task that i'm used to and again i think that not having a fear of computers and not just learning that you click that specific menu yeah. um, is important. And a lot of people are taught more by rote, even today. And I still see amongst, particularly not sort of comp sci people, but you know, people who are not developing software on computers, that they still end up sometimes taught by people in ways that mean they can really get scared if they encounter something new says Rick playing a game he's never played before. But you know, stop. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, well, that's okay. It's a platform game. I've played platform games before. I'm really struggling, by the way, that if I push my mouse forward, I look up, not down. But that's... Uh... that's a bit. <laughs> well, that's sort fine. Of, you look for the principles, right? And yeah. I think we, we continue to fail to teach people the things that will help them navigate as the world changes in computing rather than just teaching them, you know, press space to jump exactly and by the way do you see the beach there on the left side of us i think you went a bit down there but we saw it before ah i see i see some sand yes yep. maybe we'll start heading there like through the woods there to just see what the end of the island looks like because uh this is an island where we at a very hilly island making the terrain movement a bit difficult but that is fine there we are, there we go. And while we're heading there, I would love to also hear about, because I've heard so many good things about black marble. How does how do you or black marble as a whole kind of approach mentorship and helping young people get kind of started? I wasn't around at the very start of black marble. It was founded by some friends of mine. And we, we all went to, to sort of met at the university that I studied at and then worked at. And we sort of, hold by a set of really sort of key principles if you like that we wanted to create a company where we treated our customers the way we would want to be treated by by suppliers and we treated our staff fairly and hopefully sort of instilled in them the passion for the work and the technology and if you like doing right by our customers and delivering great solutions mm. that, that, that we believe in and we've we've done all kinds of things over the years that i think sort of underpin that so i mean Robert and Richard and I are still involved in organising a couple of um, one-day community conferences in the UK called DDD, uh, which does not stand for Domain Driven Design. It stands for <laughs> Developer, Developer, Developer. It was actually founded by some other UK MVPs. It's a free conference where you know great people in the industry and and new time speakers, you know anybody can put a session and come and share their experience um, and you know help other people learn. And I think that's important as an industry that it's all about making sure we don't pull the ladder up behind us and sharing the skills that we've got and helping everybody improve. And we try and do the same thing with the, the, the people that, that work for us. I'm, I'm so proud of the fact that as people have left our organization, they've all gone on to do really great things wherever they've moved to, you know, and people look to hire Black Marble staff because People that work for me don't always quite know they're born when they work for me, right? Because because we do DevOps consultancy, Richard's been doing ALM for 20 years, right? So we just sort of naturally do the things that we try and teach our customers to do and help our customers to do. But not all organizations actually really do all the time or sometimes even at all, you know, they, they don't automate they don't do continuous integration continuous deployment and i think it's it's really important to make sure that we encourage people to do things 
the best way, if you like, the best way for them, the best way for their for our customers, and to really encourage this sort of sense of excitement that we're all still learning. You know, it's tech is is a career, not a job. Yeah. By which I mean that it's all about continuous development. You know, we we sit on shifting sands. There's always something new and interesting coming out, and there's always something challenging. There's problems to solve, things we need to learn, and encouraging a love of learning and encouraging problem solving. I think is really important. We we kind of take that seriously. We try and encourage people to do that, and we we try and create a fun, interesting environment to work in. We try to build a company that we would want to work for," he said, "working for." Yeah, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I think we could actually. Do you want to try some mining now? I think that would be cool. It is called Minecraft in the end. Mine then. I can destroy blocks just by clicking and hitting them. Is that mining? Exactly. Or is that, just destroying things? that is essentially mining. So if we go here, which is usually where you would mine. So this is classic Minecraft. So we can't actually like find new supplies, minerals, rocks, types of rocks to use because it's all essentially already within our use from here. You can see like we can select different ones, but we can actually we can obviously mine, but it has, we can build caves, we can find things. And that is essentially done by just, you know, just start destroying things. <laughs> That's it, essentially in this. In the real version of Minecraft, you would use a pickaxe and whatnot. You would need to craft those, but in this one, you don't have to, so you just build like this. So you click the left to destroy, and then you can just keep it pushed down, and then you're just gonna be destroying and destroying, AKA mining. Oh, I see. Yeah, it just keeps yeah. going. So if I want to build a block, do I have to mine a block of that type then? Or is it just magic? In the, in the actual game, yes. In this one, no. You can just select a different block type from scrolling with your mouse. Oh, I see. And, yeah. yeah. And then you can build with that. Uh, but if we want, we can go and kind of burrow into the ground or mine in the, into the ground and see what's out there. There could be lava. Luckily, in this version of the game, there's no dying with lava because it's not a survival version. But we might hit it or we might not. Who knows? That's the, the fun part about it. We can start digging. We can start digging, try to find different rock types because they are visible, I think, in this. See, uh, now you make me think of our D&D &D game that we play together where we're journeying deep into the underdark, <laughs> carrying through tunnels. Here be dragons. Talking about actually D and D, what are some parallels between that and making really good tech projects? Do you know that's a really awesome question? And actually, yeah, I, I, I think I think you're right. I mean, I don't GM much. I mean, as as you know, we have a great GM in in Ricardo, and I think if you look at our part campaign, it sort of exhibits all the right hallmarks of a, of a good one, right? There's there's a compelling mm. story. There's sort of challenging villains and it can be quite hard as a, as a GM to actually, because you've got to role play them, right? So you, you're, you're trying to do all the voices and things, but you, you're also trying to make them, I think they've got to be relatable char characters. They can't just be sort of pantomime villains. And then it's it's got to be fun. There's got to be some humor. There's got to be some jeopardy. Oh, look, yet again, Rick dies this week. But then I think it's all about the cooperation between the party. And I, I think that, sort of really echoes the workplace right it's about looking at the challenge at hand it's about working together but also i think it's about supporting the people that you're with the great thing about DD is it's very much we're supporting the other members of the party right i throw myself in front of the arrow that's hurtling towards you so that you might get the spell off to shoot the bad guy confident in the knowledge that you know if i die somebody's going to come and, and and heal me hopefully i think there's a lot to be said. There's, there's, there's skill in that sort of communication and teamwork and doing things together like playing d, &D. Like we're doing now, like playing Minecraft, playing online games, you know, mm. um, games that are not necessarily just shooting each other, but, but working as a team to achieve a common objective, I think can really help people build some of the skills that they need to be successful in a, in a work environment. I also think it's it's really great if you know the people that you work with can also be your your friends. And when I say friends, I don't just mean sort of work friends, right? It's like yeah, we get on really well together five days a week. But I I love the fact that over the years I've and built some really strong friendships, both from people that work with me at Black Marble and also in the broader tech community. 
like yourself and and you know the other people in our D and D group, right? I mean, we're people that met on the speaker circuit or through being MVPs. And I love the fact that you know once once a month, travel and and, and speaker commitments permitting, we can come together and collectively solve problems and kill dragons, and then we can also use the same relationships to say, hey, I've got a problem outside of D&D. You know, mm. I've got a problem with Azure. I've got a problem with a project I'm doing. Can we have a bit of a chat? Can we share some advice? Because at the end of the day, it's all its all about people. You can't solve problems on your own. No such thing as that sort of 10x pro- programmer that just does everything and they're a one-man band. We have actually dug die quite deep already and I can't see any new rock yeah, you're types. Dig. I'm really digging. <laughs> oh it's fine but we can actually try then go all the way to the like to the bottom of the game as well if there's not like new types here okay there is actually a bottom of the world is there? that's a, that's intriguing like i can go down 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 let's see how how deep can i go this here seems to be no end while we are digging deep do you want to talk about do you have any favorite new platform as a service products I really should have checked before we started this conversation as to what's public and what's out of NDA. Yeah, so I think, uh, as as you know, Annie, I'm 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 sorry, but I'm I'm not a big fan that everything should be containers. Um, I appreciate I'm That's probably okay. saying <laughs> the wrong person, right? But so many organisations I talk to think they should be using Kubernetes, and and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with Kubernetes, but it is a 500 pound gorilla, and not well. all projects need. And I think there's there's the place for platforms as a service. And it's really exciting time in Azure at the moment for PaaS because some of those key items that we use a lot in projects are really seeing a lot of development and investment. So I, I do a lot of work in the integration space and Logic App Standard and services around that are really seeing a lot of investment. I think partly because MS want people to move away from Good old BizTalk, which is the on-prem integration solution, which yeah. I have a real love-hate relationship with. It's 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 a steady source of income for Black Marble, but it's also a steady source of pain. But there's some great development in the Logic App space about things that will help you migrate and tools that make it easier to build those integrations to move data around. We seem to have arrived at a world where you can't do anything without a VNet. I think it's a crying shame that with all these brilliant people, the default solution to security is we stick everything in a VNet. Partly because it means, it means everything is more expensive, right? I, I know Eldert needs to fund his boat, but service bus premium is expensive. API management premium is, is expensive, but these are the services I need to use if I want to connect them into a virtual network for security. So it's great to see that there's loads of investment in Azure on trying to democratize that VNet connectivity. So API management has the new V2 SKUs, and those are cool because it's a lot easier to connect them into my virtual network and have a much more cost-effective service. There's a new Logic Apps SKU coming that I think they discussed publicly at Ignite, which will allow me to do consumption but connected to a VNet. And for smaller organizations, that's a really great benefit because it's all very well saying, oh, well, you know, large enterprise customers are the ones that that need this. Well, yes, they do, and they have security requirements. But you know, you, your small organisations also have large security, you know, the same kind of security requirements. But they don't have the same the large budgets to pay three grand a month for Service Plus Premium. So it's it's lovely. It's really great to see that I'm I'm getting back to that point where I've got all of the cool serverless toys, but I can still use them in the, the VNet environment. So, yeah. you know, hopefully by the time we reach the end of this year, there's, this stuff's all going to be GA because it's currently in development. And it's going to be a real enabler for, for some of those smaller orgs that right now they're, they're sort of looking at this and going, well, I'm told I have to use a VNet. My CSPs deployed these things called landing zones, but it's really expensive for the solutions you're talking to me about, Rick. And, and I'd, I'd rather use Logic Apps consumption or you know, functions on a, a consumption plan because that's much cheaper. But how do I do that and be secure? And I think I mean, it's, it's still possible to do it and be secure, right? There are plenty of constraints and controls in PaaS, but 
the the general pushes towards vnet so yeah i think that's that's kind of cool and um i'm still enjoying watching what's happening with azure container apps which because there's nothing wrong with containers right i don't I don't hate containers. I know I, I have this reputation among my, my sort of circle of MVP friends as the container curmudgeon, right? It's like everybody goes, we should be using containers. And I go, no, 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 no can't we do PaaS? Azure Container Apps is brilliant because it takes away all that complexity of Kubernetes, but it still allows me to do a, a multi-container orchestrated application without needing to worry about the complex infrastructure. And again, I think that's really great because that's trying to democratize containers. And it's trying to take away the the things that are really difficult that organizations struggle with and leave them with the benefits that you can get from containers about how easy it can be to, to deploy and develop and manage and, and, and maintain. That sort of developer workflow is great, right? So I'm, I'm really interested still in, in what the roadmap is for, for that. Cool. Sounds really good. Following the roadmap is always nerve wracking, but really cool at the same time. Exciting. <laughs> finally found different colors of blocks down here you see i, I <laughs> exactly. knew I'd be long enough as instructed we'd start finding something <laughs> there should be maybe a bit more if it wasn't the classical version but yes we did find some sand which is exciting so should we get back to the ground and start building a house or statue as well if How you would like to How the hell? Yeah. <laughs> where did we come from i think from here maybe uh -huh. dig our way to the surface yeah, we can. Yeah, actually, true. Or we can also go to the spawn point if we are. Oh, I did find my way, actually. There I go. But obviously, any way is a good way to get to the ground as well. Are you digging or are you walking? <laughs> I am. I am hunt I'm, I'm basically seeing if I can go upwards at the moment. <laughs> okay, I'll go. I can I'll see you. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, see. there you go. There. You really went down a long way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I even I I tried to go to bedrock, but that wasn't really possible in this version, I think. So, which was a bit funky, but um, that's all right. There we go. Flying is very convenient, right. isn't it? <laughs> Then let's try to find a good spot to start building something. You're going to have to find some flat land somewhere or make some flat land if you actually want to build. Exactly, exactly. I know, I agree. Let's I will maybe fly to do like a scout. I don't because this is such hilly ground. Maybe here, if you see where I'm going. I see where you're going. There. Da, da, da. Sort of slightly surreal way that has you walking through. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think there is like ish flat ground here, so maybe uh, we'll start making it a flat ground as well. Maybe let's do this and then just start destroying the world around us. Uh, and while we destroy, what have been the kind of major learnings as you've seen tech develop? Has there been any kind of patterns or that you've been seeing? It is interesting to see the way we we do kind of go in circles so when i were a lad um you know everything was command line right there, there really were no guis when i when i started up and servers were you know network servers you had a you had a console land damager was the same the unix boxes everything was very much you know config files command line driven windows server really kind of changed that when when windows nt came out and then and then windows server it was it was the same gui on windows server as windows desktop and that again really made it very easy for smaller organizations to suddenly put a server in and manage it at the same time though it made it very easy for them to do it badly because they thought of the server as just another desktop. That really isn't true. Your server holds things and is, is managed in a, in a way that it's not just another desktop computer. I then found it really interesting when we started to shift back, you know, quite a few years ago now to servers being things that, you know, we SSH'd into and we, we talk to them with command lines and we, we try and automate manage of management of them rather than go through clicky clicky GUIs. 
and suddenly a lot of the skills that I had from old became useful again. I have a colleague as well who who talks about problem solving. Some of us old timers, just because we used to have to deal with everything, right? And when when you say full stack, you know, full stack to me is well, I start at a cable. And that, that used to be thin ethernet with T pieces and stuff. Is, like, well, is, is the cable infrastructure physically put together correctly? Are there, are there problems with that? Are the bridges and the hubs that we used to use working, which in these days are switches? And you sort of work your way up through the layers, right? And start to diagnose stuff. Whereas some of the, the, the younger generation, they live at a layer of abstraction up here, which is fantastic for productivity. It really is you know, amazing the kind of stuff we can build these days without worrying about the complexity. But as soon as something goes wrong, this abstraction layer up here is a real pain and you need to know what's going on down here. And I think there's there's a lot of, of important stuff that older people in technology, the older sysadmins have still got and, and they shouldn't be mocked because of that. You know, because they can come in and solve a problem and ask questions about, well, have you checked various bits of networking and your IP addresses and firewalls and that kind of thing because we've we've dealt with them for so long. In the age of cloud, we're back to needing to understand IPv4 and subnet masks and address allocation and a whole lot of dark magic that I was pleased to have escaped. <laughs> yeah, it all comes back to haunt you. Yeah, yeah, you're not kidding. Yes, uh, but I, I think it's an interesting irony, isn't it? That in a fast moving tech world, actually things that we learned and did 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, are now relevant again as key skills. And I, as, an, as an old man, I think that's great. <laughs> it works out really well in the end. And I actually believe very, very similarly, like a lot of the basic building blocks to keep coming back. It feels like as a, that there's just always an abstraction level on top of an abstraction level, but that's how it kind of goes. So I was thinking that we would build a house a, or a statue, whatever you want to build. And then everyone who visits the show, they're going to build something. And then we're going to have like a nice collection of all the things that everyone has built at the end of the season. We have a nice platform. You can ask me to do obviously everything or, or anything for your build. Happy to help. Or I can just keep on modifying the area around here if <laughs> if you want to have full peaceful building experience just for yourself and I'll ha I do have questions still so obviously uh, I'll be asking those as well as we go on but now we have a bit of platform here to build on so tempting though it is to build a statue I'm not sure that I am artistic enough for that so let's let, let's go with a fairly low barrier of entry and see if we can build a house right that works um, well I go okay which, so is that wood nope ah so that yeah looks I think like wood. Exactly, that is a plank. I think that one is, is works really well. Or whatever, you, you can build a, a you know rock castle as well. It all, it's all up to you. Let's see if I can build a wall. And then I'll start getting clever and putting windows in. One of the first people on the show, then, you know, I, I can make a land grab. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you can, you can grab as much. Building, every look to it. Aha, yes, Rick made that. It looks <laughs> exactly. oh, beautiful. You can get all the all the room that you want. And while we are building, I would love to know because UK and curry is is a big topic always. So from your point of view, how does the quest for the perfect curry dish or the curry restaurants shape the British tech scene? Is there any changes that happen because of that? That's a really interesting question. So you, I mean, you do realize that. So I'm a Bradford lad. So if you start asking me about curry, then. Um, Bradford is a really lovely city that gets a bit of a bum rap. We've got so many different cultures and so many different kind of societies and, and, and people living living here because so way back when we were a big mill town and people came to Bradford for both trade and to work in the mills. So we've we've got Pakistani communities, Bangladeshi communities, Indian communities, and there are so many fantastic restaurants. When I was at university, it was very much, if you like, the land of the seedy curry. You know, you'd, you'd go to a curry house after you'd been to the pub and, and it was a couple of quid for a curry and it was really good, solid. You know, you, you couldn't knock it food. Now we have the most wonderful restaurants that are winning national awards, winning international awards. We used to have, I think it was the International Curry School used to be based in Bradford a few years ago as well. So, you know, we, not only 
do we have great restaurants doing great food for Bradfordians, but were mm. you know they were teaching chefs who would go and work elsewhere. It's really great to be able to um, to live in a city where I can go and get there's there's curry for everyone, right? You can still go to a, a, a sort of like a table cheap night out with some friends where it's all about sitting around the table and you know everybody's got a curry you've got the poppadoms and these chapatis and naans and whatever he's like chipping in and, and and eating to the 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 much more sort of higher end we're going out for a special meal you know it's a birthday celebration or, mm. or whatever and yes i i have a friend who lives in birmingham he argues that birmingham has the best curry in the uk obviously he's wrong you know, he's very nice but he's but he's wrong Leed isn't bad, happens. which is right next door to Bradford, but obviously it's it's not Bradford. Bradfordian curries are very much the best, and we've got we have a, a a few curry houses in Bradford that are very well known. So there's the Cashmere, which um, you'll remember I took you to last year, which was one of the first curry houses in Bradford. That's like 30, 40 plus years old. A really nice place. Yeah, and 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 is very much that sort of accessible sort of cheap curry but then we've also got Mumtaz and Mumtaz is a is a much more sort of higher end curry house and they also make you can buy Mumtaz curries in Harrods and get your Mumtaz lassie in 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 jars and and jugs and things in in Harrods so you know back to that Bradford gets a bum rap there's there's a lot of sophistication in 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 Bradford curries and, and itself yeah sounds really good is there like a competition whenever, for example, work for a tech company and so forth, when you're trying to find a curry place, is there like a fight over which one is the best one or does everyone always know that one place is the best one hands down or how does it go? Uh, everybody has their favorites, to yeah. be fair. Again, it depends where you are. So different different cities, because they have different communities, have different styles of curry. And, and I think it, it also depends sort of where you were first exposed to it. So curry houses, Certainly when I was growing up in, in Bradford, a lot of them are, are run by Muslims. They're dry, right? You, you, you can't buy alcohol, which is absolutely fine. So I grew up drinking lassie in curry houses. And as you know from going for curry with me, if I, if I go for a curry, the last thing I think about is wanting a bottle of beer to go with the curry. Some other places, the, the, the curry houses serve alcohol and, and that sort of tradition of getting a curry and a beer comes in. So. It does depend what kind of a night out we're looking for, right? Mm. Um, set aside the whole, do we do curry then beer or beer then curry? Which is an argument in itself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm too old for these days, but it always used to be curry curry then beer in my head, but most of my friends were, oh, and it's beer then curry. Um, and then we get the arguments to whether you want cutlery or not. You can't eat a curry with cutlery. You know, you're yeah. supposed to eat a curry with, with the chapati or the naan. Again, I think sort of comes down to can I build a block in midair? I think you might yes, not can. be able to. Um, oh, you can. Oh, that's good. Or oh, if it's connected that way, yeah, you can. Like, you don't need to put anything in between. True, 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 yeah. Well, I guess you could, you know, in a real house as well, connect it via, the, you know, like a steel rod or something to the <laughs> building material there. But it might not follow all the logics of, of physics with the flying and whatnot, this, this game, so. Good. Physics and I have a, a, you know, a bit of a torrid relationship. <laughs> So while you're finishing the windows, I guess, and whatnot, uh, I would have like a lightning round of questions where I have this or that questions, essentially. So okay. we can kick this off. Tabs or spaces? Tabs, because they're more accessible. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's a good reason. Mac, Windows or Linux? I choose all three, Bob. Oh, <laughs> I've, that's I've, okay. I've used and do use all. I love the Windows subsystem for Linux and how that's really sort of opened up more access to more people for Linux. But as as I said earlier, right, I've used everything. Back back before OS X, it was it was MacOS and I used to manage Macs and PCs. And then when Linux arrived, we sort of embraced that at the university I worked in. I went, hey, this looks cool. I, I worked with a guy who was was very he was very purist, you know? If, if, if you didn't compile the kernel yourself, you weren't really doing it properly. Um, and I, I think there's a place for all of these. And I think the whole sort of religious, I want to build, not destroy, that, you know, my operating system is better than your operating system. Really, have we not got over that in this day and age? 
I actually like that approach. You know, every, everything, as always in life, has its benefits and everything has its downfall. So, you know, it's all good. Whatever yeah. works for you makes sense. Then iOS or Android, kind of in the same way, both is also an okay answer. <laughs> yeah, same. So, I mean, Sarah, my wife, has all iPhones. I have an Android mainly because as a company we make Android applications. We don't, it's not that we can't do iOS, we just don't tend to. I I dislike the fact that it's competing ecosystems. It would be nice that things are a bit more interoperable, but yeah, yeah, you know. The one that I miss is Windows Phone. And I, I know that sort of cliche, right? Oh, you're a Microsoft MVP, you miss Windows Phone. Yeah, yeah, ha ha. But it really was so easy to use. And I, I miss the, the tiles that showed me exactly what was going on in my day. And we're still not really there yet with, even though we're getting more widgets and things on, on other phones, it's still not as accessible and, and immediately obvious to me what's going on. Exactly. Agile or waterfall? Ooh, agile. Although, so let's be honest, Particularly if you're a, a contract developer like we are, what most organizations actually tend to do is scrum fall or scrum butt, right? What well, we do scrum butt. So many of my projects, we're doing agile internally, and then there's some kind of more formal waterfall, maybe Prince interaction with the customer just because that's what they want to use. In the UK, particularly, that whole sort of time and materials billing is still not the norm which means we've got to estimate and we, we you know we've got to try and give fixed price quotes and, and and that kind of stuff and and fixed price quotes means we've got to start defining milestones and stuff so mm. that sort of leads us to some waterfally components for for good or for bad and some organizations just can't really handle agile there's a there's a there's a level of maturity you need right to be able to do agile well you can and you do that's excellent but you shouldn't be for and also customer is always right so you know <laughs> that's that saying so it makes that's sense to do that is, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> that is not always always the case but you know it makes sense to respect it all yeah. i mean i think no matter what the customer there are things that we insist on, right? We always do continuous integration. Uh, you know, when when certainly whenever a, we, we do pull requests, when a pull request goes through, we do a build and we run tests on that. We deploy it, we test it. And it doesn't matter what your overall project methodology is. I think there's just certain good practices and things that every software project should do. You know, supply chain analysis, making sure you're looking at your dependencies and making sure you're, you're, you've got a, an engineering overhead to keep ensuring you're updating the tooling you're using, the frameworks you're using, the third-party libraries you're using. Those are kinds of things that certainly a, my org sort of takes for granted. But a, a lot of a lot of companies still don't. And I think there are still developers out there that aren't necessarily in touch with the community that we can still sort of reach out to and go, hey, look, this is a better way. You don't have to do full agile if it doesn't really work for you, but you should be doing these sort of core things to make sure your project is successful and your company is protected from the outside world. Cool. Final question of the lightning round, Java versus Python. I speak neither. So uh, amusingly, Black Marble started as a, as a Java shop. Um, so I certainly don't have any problem with Java. And in, in fact, a very good friend of mine used to be the, the, the UK sort of head of, of Java for, for some. Again, why the religious war, right? It, you pick the most appropriate tool for the job in hand. The one thing I hate is I don't care what the question is, the answer is Java or JavaScript. That I, I disagree with vehemently. But if you're a Python developer and Python's an appropriate technology for the problem at hand, brilliant, go you. You know, I mean, why, why are we having a go at languages and, and the people that, that use them? But I think, you know, everything has its place. I, and in the same way as you know, a lot of games are still written in C++ for performance rather than some of the abstracted languages like 
.NET or, or Java. He said playing a game written in Java. <laughs> um, you know, don't, don't try and force it that everything has to be Python. Very true, in my opinion. It makes sense to let everyone use what they want to use. And it's always kind of, there's these, always the kind of surveys or studies come out with like, okay, which is most performant, which is most sustainable and so forth. But honestly, quite often, the one that you know the best is also the best one for you. Because, you know, it's it's better to write good Python, for example, than to write bad Python as far as sustainability and so forth. So it's always, you know, uh, it depends on your skill set and the, your team's skill set, as well as like the goals that you have for your project and so forth. So you can never give like an all in recommendation. As long as whatever you're using, you can unit tests in, you can you can test it, you know, you can check the quality of the code that you're writing. I don't really mind what language you use. Exactly. I so agree. Is the house building, is it? Getting there. I'm just yeah. <laughs> no rush, no rush. I was wondering. But it is looking magnificent, by the way. It is a very big house. I hope I need to do a dome, but I'm not sure I can really properly do domes in Minecraft, so it's more <laughs> a pyramid. That's, that's okay, you know. People are going to see this later on and go, wow, aliens must have come down and built that. Well, you know, it's close enough. Exactly. Yeah. Loading aliens for sure, at least. Perfect. Yep. It is well, quite big. Stairs now, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it's fine. We're not in the survival version, so we can fly. So, you know, it's, it, it's working out. But it does have a door, so that's nice. Or like, a, you know... Um, doorway that's cool uh, do you have a name for the building oh now you're asking me really difficult questions <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy with Shay Rick that, that works doesn't it it's sort of sophisticated. that is beautiful okay. that is gorgeous it's a really nice house and luckily uh, it's gonna be forever or like you know kind of in this server so there's no need to I was just thinking about should we take a picture or something but no it's gonna be here no matter what happens or you know obviously someone could destroy it let's hope that that doesn't happen so it's all good yeah, forever the eyesore on the corner of the island <laughs> exactly <laughs> and i think it's time for us to start wrapping up with this magnificent building here is there any final notes that you want to kind of tell the audience something that they should check out from you or something that you would like to kind of oh no that's a really interesting question um I think we've really touched on a lot of stuff. A lot of the conversations I'm having these days are very much, I think many of us who adopted things like Agile, things like Cloud, things like CICD, we've been doing it for years. We've lost sight of the fact that there are members in the community who still don't do that. It isn't the norm, right? It isn't ubiquitous. Not everybody uses Cloud, but everybody potentially could. And I think one of the things I'm trying to do this year in the sessions that I'm I'm putting into conferences and, and the, the events that I'm supporting is, is really trying to get, not back to basics, but to try and find those people that we haven't embraced yet and, and show them the great things that they could be doing and how their lives could be better and then get distracted by all the new cool stuff that's coming out, right? And there is so much of that and there's always going to be so much of that. Um, and eventually I'm just going to sit there and go, I'm too old to keep up. <laughs> um, now I'm not and I'm enjoying it and I, I, I hope I'll keep learning and keep doing stuff for, for a while yet perfect that's an amazing final note to end us on oh, thanks for having me my, my first time playing Minecraft I've, I've had a blast <laughs>